the spirit of democracy, the spirit of America, we take it for granted. We take who we are for granted. We don't know our own history uh, as well as we should. Welcome to Armory with Donnie Deutsch. I am Donnie Deutsch, and this is the podcast. Uh, well, this is a podcast. You know this podcast. You listen, but I'll tell you anyway. Uh, what we do here is uh, we kind of go on the premise that everything is a brand. Every person, every celebrity, every athlete, every corporation, every company, every product, every religion, everything today is a brand. If you've got a Facebook page and you're putting images out there and statements, well, then you're, you're a brand. Uh, you're putting your value system out there. We do two things on the show. Uh, first of all, we interview a, a big personality about their own personal brand today. It's the great Mike Barnacle. Mike, as you know, is one of the stalwarts of, uh, I think that's a word, stalwart, of Morning Joe, uh, one of the most famous uh, columnists of all time, spent most of his life at the Boston Globe, but a bunch of other places also. Uh, brilliant guy, one of the nicest people on the planet. He's become a dear friend of mine. He's going to be by a little while to talk what's going on in the world. But first, we do what we also call our brands of the week. These are the brands that are uh, driving the zeitgeist, who's up, who's down, what brands are winning, what brands are losing. And backed by huge popular demand, uh, national correspondent for Vanity Fair, best New York Times bestselling author of the, of the book Born Rich. If you haven't read it, go go grab it on the uh, Trump family, Emily Jane Fox. Emily, welcome. Hi, I'm so happy to be back. I'm, I also, I can hear a, a loud, uh, almost one-year-old in the background, so I apologize. No, but we do real stuff. That's right. So that's- So happy. Her name is June, by the way, here. and she's adorable, and she'll be yeah. doing Brands of the Week in a number of years, but right now she's just- doing stuff like crawling and, and stuff like that, I, right? I hear her walker banging into the wall. That's what I hear right now. <laughs> hey, All right, let's get right into it. Our, our first one, I'm going to start with the first one, Emily. It's um, America's attention span, a brand down for that. And this is a kind of a thing. Axios and News Whip did a thing where they showed social media interactions based on articles off Uvalde. And three days after there were three, there were uh, 8 million interactions. And then four days after that, there were 300,000. And the, the the challenge is how do we keep, I know this time feels a little different. We always say that. And unfortunately, what keeps it in the news is just this past weekend, there were 18 more shootings. But Americans, the parade tends to move on and we've got to keep them focused this time. You know, in every, every morning I open homepages of all the places that you and I open and I see these shootings and I scroll past them because I'm like, well, that's another morning in America, right? And if I am scrolling past them, I can't even imagine the people who don't even open homepages in the morning. And then we've been completely desensitized to it. And I think it's the most tragic thing of our generation. Yeah. It's just absolutely gutting and appalling. And uh, nothing gets done because the system is broken. And I honestly don't even know how you fix it. Yeah. I, I, you, I, I want to get ahead, ahead of ourselves a little bit. What I still don't understand, and I, I talked about this on the air last week, is that it's not even bravery for the Republicans at this point. When you have 90% of Americans wanting universal background checks and 85% on flag laws and 70% on banning assault weapons, I don't even get the politics of them not doing it at this point. And okay, well, they're going to get primary and whatnot, but I, I, I just... It, something's got to change. It's just, it's just. It's money. Ridiculous. It's, uh, it's obviously, it's, it's, uh, the political will is there, but the purse strings are still being held really tight. Um, it's a, it's a bit of a, of a left turn, but it's on the topic of attention span. And there's okay. something I wanted to bring up to sure. you this week. So the UK okay. is testing a pilot program this week. Okay. Thousands of workers are starting a four day work week with no cut to their pay, and it's the largest trial of this kind. It will be for six months and involves 3,300 workers spanning 70 companies um, from providers for financial services to fish and chip restaurants. Right. I'm obsessed with this idea. I think Is this a brand up genius. or a brand down for you? Brand, he, Huge like brand way up. up. Okay. Uh, through the roof. All right. I think a four-day work week is the smartest thing that could ever be proposed. And the study that's being conducted over the course of six months is, can people work four days a week and be as productive? And I think unequivocally, yes, because you're happier in your life. You are you have time to do all the things you want to do on the three days. You're not distracted. I think it's a genius idea. Yeah. You know, look, I... I I go back, I'm a little back and forth on it. I know that if you gave, I always say something that in, in, when I have meetings, when I used to have meetings when I was running my company, and let's say they were slighted for two hours, I'd say, let's make it a 15 minute meeting. 
and mm-hmm. it would end up being more productive because people just exactly. weren't filling up the space of molecules in the air for, for an hour and 45 minutes. So if you go on that yes. premise, yes, the question is, will people, this, the same thing that forces them to focus in 15 minute meeting versus a two hour meeting, will they bring that same focus to four days over five days or will it just be just like five days, but now four days. So with 20% less efficiency. Well, here's, here's what I think the difference is. It's like, okay, you, you have been a boss. I've never been a boss, but I've been an employee. Right. Mm -hmm. And so when you're an employee, you're like, okay, well I have to go to the dentist. So I'm going to leave because I don't have any work days off. Right. Every day is, 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 Mm -hmm. is accounted for. I need, or I need to take my kid to the shoe store and they're not open the weekends, whatever. So if you have a full day where you're not interrupted in the middle of your work day, doing all the things that you need to do during the week, maybe you're more productive. I don't know. I think it's genius. I'm excited about it. Well, we'll see. We'll keep an eye on that. Hey, this is one that's right in your wheelhouse. Jared Kushner, uh, mm. house pound, brand down for him. He's always going to get a brand down in this show. House pound investigates the Saudi investment in the Kushner firm. Jared Kushner, who never really ran money before, all of a sudden after doing business with the crown prince, got $2 billion in his fund. What I do you mean, know? Amazing how that works. What are the odds? Uh, incredible I just, coincidence. I just this bizarre coincidence, a guy who's never written, you know, he's a real estate guy. He never had a fund before. Mm-hmm. And just somehow, you know, the, the MBS felt he was, important to give Jared Kushner $2 billion. Fell right what, in his lap. What, what, what can you tell us about that? Well, I think uh, it's about time. I think that this is the most flagrant ethics violation in the history of the world. It, it is what um, people like me have been screaming about for the last six years. It was the entire problem with someone like Jared Kushner who had um, huge private holdings and mounting debt, taking a job in the White House in the first place and, and, particularly from a family that doesn't seem to have uh, tremendous moral scruples. So this is sort of what everyone was saying, worry about this happening, happened, and I'm glad that it's being investigated. All right, I got one more for you that's definitely in your Ooh. wheelhouse also. Uh, Cheryl Sandberg, huge brand down. She's stepping down from Facebook, uh, taking $1.7 billion, whether she sold, she still got another probably three, four, five, six hundred million dollars in stock. And what I find offensive about her is, look, Facebook is... Has been the most has been the most destruction of any corporation in in my life. I'll put them with cigarette companies in a different way. Yeah. Um, Cheryl oversaw the algorithms that amplify and and hate and and disinformation and conspiracy theories, and spent most of her career just like the top people there, trying to dodge the bullets there instead of fixing the problem. And what bothered me about her is that she was supposed to be the grown up in the room, and she's always this female empowerment and lean in and all this bullshit. And yet here you were on top of the evil empire, not doing anything about it. Okay. Can I take issue with a phrase that you just said? And it's not your fault, but it's a general thing. I hate the term grown up in the room. Okay. When you refer to someone who's working at Facebook or for years when we were covering the Trump administration, people would say it about people in the White House. Right. By definition, if you are working in the White House or at one of the biggest companies (laughs) in the world, everyone is an adult there, right? No one, the fact that these people need minders, like something is so broken. The president shouldn't need other adults in the room. Mark Zuckerberg shouldn't need other adults in the room. So to put responsibility on other people, it's it's, it's insane. We've lost the way. Um, I don't know that it's Sheryl Sandberg's responsibility to be walking the chief executive and founder of the company through anything. That is, the onus is on him. But I will say that I believe that anyone who works at Facebook has blood on their hands. So yeah, I don't, I, she's not, she's not a, a savior. She is part of the problem, a huge part of it. I'm going to take us, I'm going to take us to another woman on top, okay. but in a very different Another way. woman. I always love women on top. I, uh, I'm going to leave <laughs> I that. Love, I love when I cause you to just stumble. And Honestly, no every time I blush, every time I'm here. Um, did you watch the Queen's Jubilee at all? Any of the coverage I saw highlights. It? I have some real oh. feelings about it. Don't you just love watching royal coverage? It no. feels why the opposite. I, I just are you f- broken? I I, <laughs> I even said this on Morning Joe and the other morning. I said, why are we why are we running this stuff? I ah. just find it so ridiculous. It's so yes. it's this basically this drunken incest laden family and why do we care and what's interesting yes. about them? Yeah, yes. help, help me because I'm a big brand okay. down on that. You're a monster brand up. Explain it. Oh my tell, god! Tell me okay. what we love about the royals. Okay, the royal. I'm gonna. I'll preface this by saying the royal family is deeply problematic. They have roots in As colonialism and racism right, okay, and whatever. Right, right. Um, and that's terrible. And and all of that said, um, they are just otherworldly. And it is such a weird, rich, 
crazy crackpot of characters who all defer to everybody. And then you have this country that's like in the middle of a pandemic. They have a uh, prime minister who they're giving a vote of no confidence to. Everyone's booing him. And you just like have everyone with Union Jack flags hailing the queen. They're going to wave to her on a balcony. Everyone's wearing crazy hats and bright colors. And it just feels very charming and quaint. And I just feel like uh, I can get behind people just like wanting to party and celebrate someone who's served them for 70 years. It just feels so fun and charming. The outfits are amazing. Their carriages, like the the British people know how to live. They're like, uh, they're on horse-drawn gold carriages yeah. down the street. Yeah. Imagine seeing that here. We have like yeah. machine well, I, guns I and monster trucks. I guess my my thing, once he, once Prince Charles had, where they found messages he was sending to Camilla that he wanted to be a tampon and be inside her. I mean, that kind of just ended any illusion. Okay, of, you've just ruined it for me. I, <laughs> now it's, it's over. You don't remember that one? That was, he was pretty special. No, about that. I yeah. somehow escaped it and I really, um, <laughs> I'm not happy that I've now been <laughs> That was a famous it. message from the very twist, twisted, Ugh. tweaked uh, Prince Charles. All right, I got one for you. I got one for you. It, this is from Biden and, and the First Lady. It's called Fexting. And basically what it is, is fighting by text that they realize they can't fight because there's always secret service people around and always people around, obviously late at night when they're alone in their bedroom. But other than that, there's always people around. So they decided that they would only argue by text. I give that a brand down because I get into my biggest problems fighting by text with somebody. Like what? Name them. Any girlfriend I've ever had in my life, that's not Mm. the way to fight because it just, no matter what you do, it's just like, oh. You know, I mean, so like I'm sitting there with my girlfriend and I'm texting and I'm like, no, I don't mean it that way. Well, yes, you do. You know, and I always immediately say, can we stop texting? Yeah. Well, you lose the context, but you have time to come up. If you're a good writer, <laughs> it could it could be your best medium. It really depends on how good of a writer you are, right? That's how I feel. <laughs> well, when you with your husband, do you guys fight by text? We actually, you don't fight. Don't, don't fight. I don't want to hear this. I'm this sorry. I'm sorry. You don't really, like, really <laughs> like never. We've never been of the fighters. Um, but if we were to fight, we're both writers, so so it would actually be pretty juicy. Maybe maybe <laughs> be a mini series. We publishing. Wait, speaking of of families fighting, there's a brand situation I really want your take on. We haven't talked about this yet, and it feels crazy. The the Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial is, uh, I feel like it's the greatest brand rebranding moment of a generation, and I want to hear your take on it. I don't it's know so if funny. I was going to get to it, and I was really thinking about how does this affect the Me Too movement? You know, this is the first yeah. time that somebody has been held liable uh, for saying what they said about a man, in this case, about domestic violence, and the Washington Post had run the story. And I'm just curious to you, do you, you know, we have lived in a world, and everything, there's always pendulums, and they swing. And obviously, the Me Too movement swung to the point where you couldn't even question a woman who was making statements or allegations or whatnot. And, and I wonder, you know, because it just, it was this time of, we have to listen, we have to listen, we have to listen. And I get that. And I wonder if this changes any of the uh, mathematics there. Yeah, because I think, I actually think what happened is kind of tragic. I think that, first of all, I'm shocked that this verdict happened because it's so hard to prove Yes. Defamation. Yes. Like it is, it's almost impossible. So I'm actually shocked just from a legal standpoint. Um, and I think that this does damage to the women who do come forward and it's a disservice to people who have been abused. And, it, and I'm sure that there are many, many, many people across the world who are watching this and it makes it really scary for them to speak up um, and, and tell the truth. Um, I think what we witnessed is someone who intentionally filed this lawsuit to rebrand himself, Right. And it worked. Like the jury came back with a verdict that no one expected because Johnny Depp very skillfully uh, won in the court of public opinion. The entire thing played out on TikTok. Right. Like you had all these people watching the footage and making these TikTok videos and they all went viral. And so, so many people were tuning into this every single day and getting a one-sided thing and it worked. And like, I don't know if he's going to work in Hollywood again, but he might. He, he, he was vindicated by this. He was vindicated. I mean, was, you know. That so was his entire thing. It seems like the relationship was incredibly toxic and abusive yeah. and that these people are off their rockers. Yeah, I can't but, see Johnny Depp in a normal relationship with anybody. That's not to say Am- blame Amber Heard one way or the other, but I just know oh, Johnny just, Depp. This whole just thing saying, feels gross. And yeah, messy. I just, you know. Yeah, I, I was not, I was just more curious your take on how this affects the Me Too movement. And be yeah, I think that. I think it makes it harder for women to yeah. come forward. And I think that uh, for, we've lived in the era of believe women over the last f- 
few years, rightfully. And now I think um, that goes, this, this takes it a step back and that's really sad and that's really upsetting. I hear you. I hear you. Um, hey, as, I'm curious things. about CNN. I give brand yeah. CNN a brand question mark. They announced mm. they're going to, cutting back on overhyping everything is breaking news. You know, every banner is breaking news. And Chris Lick, the new uh, new president there, for, but new CEO there, a buddy of mine, uh, and Dave Zasloff, who was the, the head of Discovery, Warner Brothers, who basically said they're going to go back to more news, straight down the middle, not opinion, prime time. Is that going to work? I mean, I know that's a great thesis to say right now, but is there a market for that when now we've created this world where people can get bespoke news? You can get on your phone, breaking news anytime you want. And you tune on, a lot of people now at this point tune on the news for opinion. So is just straight news down the middle going to work for CNN? Um, no, but I <laughs> admire them them trying. I mean, look, I hear all the time, because uh, people love to tell me their thoughts on what's wrong with journalism, Yeah, uh, that I just, there's nowhere for me to get straight news anymore. And I think it is definitely harder to get straight news. Uh, but I don't think a lot of people who are watching cable news want to yes. watch yeah. Straight news. So I think I think there is a huge market for good reporting that is factual. Yeah. But I don't think that the audience who want that kind of reporting are the kind of people who watch cable See, news. I would go in a way, if you want to walk away from being skewed, not about straight news, but showing, giving both sides, making an opinion, but having both, like on MSNBC, you don't have the other side on. On Fox, you don't. Because if you went, I would never go on Fox because what they would do is they would set me up and they would have a clip from me from 1996 saying something like, it's like, it's not a fair play. But if there was a forum where you know you could get on and it could debate and it could be a brutal debate, it could be a gentlemanly debate, debate, whatever it is, that's where you don't see, you know, so you still have opinion in there, but it's not skewed to one side. The part of the problem is that there's not a ton of moderation anymore. So yeah. even the people who you would get to debate one another, the the extremes are so just, far just apart right that you yeah. can't really have a moderate debate anymore because there aren't a lot of moderates. So yeah. I think uh, we we've become so polarized that it's really hard to have. What else you got? Uh, I have I have one last okay. brand up uh, brand down I guess up and down. Um, the national gas price just jumped to almost $5 a gallon, 10 states. Gasoline is above $5 a gallon in California. It's, I, I drive an electric car, thank God, but it is out of control every time I drive past. President Biden said uh, last week that there's little he can do to lower this and it's going to hurt everyone at the pumps. I would imagine it's going to hurt Democrats at the polls. And this just feels like one of those things that if it is not addressed... It is going to be a disaster. You, you've in got oil prices at an all-time high. You've got the Russia situation. It is really, so it's a quagmire. It's a little bit of a Rubik's cube at this point. Something's got to give, but uh, you don't have a front. You can't blame it all on Putin, but that's certainly caught, you know, causing a, a real issue in 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 the in the, in the template here. That ever everyone across every right. income level feels it, and and that's just inescapable. It's where you feel it. You feel it in gas and groceries. That's where you feel it. I got two yeah, more. I, mean, I got two more for you because I know they're right in your wheelhouse. First is a brand down for food delivery services. Did you know when was the last time you ordered food at home? Just out of curiosity. Yesterday. Okay. Eight in ten delivery workers admit to eating a customer's food. <laughs> According oh, to Circuit Route Planner. Don't do this for me. This First is, Prince Charles. This is I know, yeah. No. Uh that basically uh eight and ten, they said, and the reason they give is uh they don't like the customers because they give bad tips. They accuse customers of tip baiting, which means says they're going to give good tips. 57% they can't stand when customers let their dogs bark at them or harass them. 25% they've also said they've they've hooked up with someone in their vehicle. So next time you're getting your your you know your Taco Supreme from Taco Bell, I, I know that's what you and lo your loved one like to have, those special, those mm -hmm. burritos and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Nothing says romance like Taco Bell. No. <laughs> well, I, I mean, this just makes, I guess I'm just going to cook now over for me. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's not really happening. vile. No. I, okay. One more last one, just because I just, it just was very near and dear to my heart. The original Gerber baby, the Gerber baby, baby Ann Turner Cook died at 95. You know, that cute little baby that's on the cover. Aww, of I just thought it was somebody who has a little, yeah. She won a contest. Oh, that's so sad. I know that little face that's on, still on the, like she's 95. She passed away. Just thought well, I'd give gone, her a little big Gone, but up. never forgotten. Gone, but never forgotten. Wait, I have I have one to end on. I okay. this is this is out there, but I had to bring it up for you because um I've never heard of a story that like I feel like ticks off more boxes than this one. Okay. Have you heard at all about Mormon moms on TikTok? 
No, but I'm about to get very, very <laughs> intrigued. Okay. Okay. So there are a lot of Mormon moms who are, you know, 22 and have eight Nine kids, children. Right. Okay. And they're beautiful. They're very put together. They're extremely fit. Um, and they like are broadcasting their lives online. And, and a lot of them are friends. And so you get to know these friend groups and they're doing dances and, and lip singing and all this right. shit. There was a scandal that erupted in the Mormon mom TikTok community this week where one of these women announced that she was getting divorced and that she and all of her Mormon mom TikTok friends were in were doing soft swinging with all of their partners and she had fallen in love with one of the other women's husband and now that there are there are two divorces happening in the wow. group some of them are being excommunicated well, was there any polygamy in this out. is there any of this any of these women well, they're all swinging they're not, they so refer not, to each other jokingly as sister wives they're wow. not but now it's, it's like those wacky it's, it's Mormons, rocking them man. Those rocking the Mormon moments. mom TikTok. Community. So if I wanted to, if I wanted to just follow this, I just go on TikTok and just put more. Okay, yeah. I'll send you some. Only links. because I'm just I do research for the show and uh -huh. I, need, I need to be current on things. You, I honestly, I honestly just I I desperate. Maybe next week we, we do a live we, viewing just so we can we're hear your going, reaction. It's going to be it's going to be a recurring one on this thing. Emily Jane Fox, Perfect. I love you. Thank you so much for your time. Love you. And let's get right to our interview with the great, the legendary Mike Barnacle. I am thrilled with today's guest. Um, he is a dear friend of mine, uh, one of my favorite people around. He's the legendary columnist, Mike Barnacle. Uh, I want to get this right. He's the senior contributor and veteran columnist, MSNBC's Morning Joe. He's written over 4,000 columns, Boston Globe, Boston Herald, New York Daily News, award-winning. I'm going to read from, from his own website. Did you know you have a website, by the way? No, I don't. I have a, I have a wonderful woman in California who does the website that met her about four or okay. five times. And here's, here's what it says. Mike Barnacle is best known for his street smart, straightforward commentary and writing style that gives voice to every man with inside perspective and an incisive wit. Mike Barnacle can be irascible and colorful, sarcastic and skeptical, but ultimately seeks to find the good in people. And I actually concur with that. Thank you for doing my show, my friend. It's my pleasure, Donnie. It's amazing. It's about time you had your own show again. <laughs> so... Mostly, I want to talk about the state of the Red Sox because, I mean, I don't really follow the standings, but I think it's the Yankees after 25 games are like nine or 10 games up already. And, you know, I'd just like to hear your perspective on the Red Sox. Well, you know, first of all, baseball, Major League Baseball is like life. They play it every day. Uh, it's filled with hits and errors. They, you know, we make mistakes. They call it errors in baseball. It's a long season. There's about uh, 100 and 45 games left to play. Uh, the Red Sox suck right now. Uh, they, <laughs> they're having difficulty hitting. They're playing with a couple of minor leaguers in the regular lineup, unfortunately for them. Nice kid, Bobby Dahlbeck at first base. Jackie Bradley Jr. in right field. Wonderful fellow, great defensive outfielder. Not a major league hitter. So you don't survive in that division, the American League East where the New York Yankees and the Toronto Blue Jays are absolute powerhouses this year, uh, unless you pull together a better lineup, which is what they're going to work on. And, uh, you know, they'll be competitive throughout the summer. And I think, uh, you know, their best bet at right now, looking at it right now, their best bet is the extra wild card team that's going to be employed in baseball this year. I want to go back a little bit. Um, you, you know, what Jeremy Breslin was to New York, what Mike Rocco was to Chicago. You, you were an art of Boston. Um, how is it you're, you, obviously your purchase on Morning Joe today, but you spent a lot of time knocking on doors, as you like to talk about as far as when you're covering. How do you kind of see the way journalists attack things today versus when you were growing up in the business? And, and you know, what, what to you is, because you have such a unique perspective, because this is where your age comes in your favor, whereas usually guys like you and I, our age works against yeah. us a lot of times. But this is where age, so I kind of love to hear your perspective of as you sit on the perks now, Morning Joe, versus knocking on doors in the streets of Boston, how things have changed for you. Well, you know, the, the entire business, the entire newspaper business has changed drastically uh, nearly everyone in, in America, nearly everyone in the world knows what's happened to newspapers, the print product at least. Uh, a ton of them have disappeared over the last uh, couple of decades. Advertising went online, and once that happened, 
you know, the things that carry newspapers financially, automobile ads, amusement ads, movie ads, stuff like that, all gone overnight almost in a relative period of time. But I think today, today's business uh, has an incredible number of really smart people, uh, really smart young reporters and writers working at the few existing powerful papers that are still left on the scene. The problem, as I see it, is because of the dominance of the internet and the uh, the online product, which, uh, you know, look at the New York Times. I mean, I think they're up to 10 million online subscribers. So that's carrying the weight of the paper. But there's there's a tendency, I think, in a lot of major newspapers to try and get something online as soon as possible. I understand it. You know, so instead of writing for the first edition, which would close at 7.30 or 8 o'clock at night years ago, now you can, you know, can you get something online at 2 o'clock in the afternoon or 3 o'clock in the afternoon? And they do it. And a lot of them do it quite well and quite admirably, except you miss one thing that we used to have the luxury of 15, 20, 25 years ago. And that is you go out and you find out what you're writing about. You research what you're writing about. And then you get the opportunity, whether you finish your reporting out in the street or whatever, at three or four o'clock or even six o'clock at night, you had the luxury of being able to think about what you just saw, what you just witnessed, what you observed, and what you think about it. Because the demand for online sort of compresses the time element. And you miss that luxury of having the space and the time to sit and think about what you're about to write. I think that's, to me, that's the biggest difference. What's the one or two or three columns that stay with you all these years later that that you wrote, whether it's the impact it had or just how it affected you? I mean, you've just seen so much. And I just, looking back, what is kind of stuck in your gut? You know, oddly enough, the way my mind works, there was a series of columns I wrote at the 50th anniversary of D-Day in, in Normandy, in France, and traveling throughout Normandy, that particular late May and June. And several of those have stuck with me across all the years. Uh, and they have, they, they have and have still today an impact on me. When you think about, when you see, when you see, when you stand there at Pont du Hoc, in Normandy and see the sheer cliff 125 yards straight up and think that American Rangers climb that cliff straight up, climb that cliff on that morning of June 6, 1944. It's a staggering thing to see. And then you travel throughout the French countryside. Everybody thinks of D-Day in Normandy, uh, saving Private Ryan and you know, the American Cemetery, where a large portion of that movie was shot, which is beautiful. It's a huge expanse of territory owned today by the United States government, maintained by the United States government, as are all American cemeteries throughout Europe. And it's bright and open to the sea, out to the coast, the beach below. It's beautiful. Uh, And yet you travel around Normandy down through St. Mary Glees and other spots where the war took place, and it took place everywhere throughout Normandy in that June and that summer. And you find several other American cemeteries, smaller, but still well-maintained. And you also find in a place called La Cam, which is about maybe eight or nine kilometers, seven or eight miles from the American cemetery, the big American cemetery, and as open and bright and clear and beautiful as the American cemetery is, Lacan is a German cemetery filled with German war dead. And it has dark Gothic stones and it's in a pine forest. So the sunlight doesn't get in there as it does at the American cemetery. And you look at the headstones and you see that the age ranges of those killed, those German soldiers killed, in Normandy, in France, in that summer of 1944, range in ages largely grouped between 18, 19, and 20 years of age, and then it jacks up to 
45, 46, 47 years of age with very little in between. And you realize that there wasn't much left in the German army at that stage of the war. It lost so many people uh, in Russia uh, that reinforcements to France can be you know, with basically young kids and old men. And that makes a dent on you. The ultimate dent, America, along with a couple of other nations, so basically the United States of America went to Europe and saved civilization. And I think we forget that as Americans. We forget too much of our history. And we don't know our own history. And I think the value of this country and the meaning of this country is sometimes lost to a lot of people because of that lack of knowledge, lack of awareness. Mike, just let's sit against the backdrop of the greatness of, of America looking back. Uh, and now in the present day, uh, the news of Roe v. Roe v. Wade uh, being overturned, or at least opinion out there that says that that's going to happen. Give me your gut reaction as somebody now just talking against first the backdrop of the greatness of America and now something that for you and for me and people who fought for equality and decency and, and, and freedom, democracy, and all the things that, the good stuff. Give me your gut reaction to just as soon as you saw that news. Well, my gut reaction then is the same as my reaction right now, sitting here speaking to you. Depression. I was depressed uh, about one more attempt, one more real attempt uh, by, and I realize it's the Supreme Court, but the, the rhetoric and the ideology involved in the decision had, to my mind, less to do with the law than it had to do with trying to you know, take another chunk out of our democracy. Uh, I mean, the, the judge, Alito, in his, in his opinion, if you read it, writes about the initial Roe versus Wade decision, and he criticizes the decision and basically criticizes the Supreme Court justices you know, who, who voted for it. I think the vote was seven to two. Uh, he criticizes the decision, calls it poorly thought out, blah, 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 and indicates that it created great dissent and concern in the United States of America and great division in the United States of America. <clears throat> and he goes on to write a decision that is going to make any division that was created in 1973 look absolutely minor, like you can ignore it. It never happened because the division that this particular opinion has caused and has created already within the week, within the time span of a few days, is enormous. And I, I, it's just depressing when you figure, you know, everything else that's going on in the Congress of the United States where they can't get together on things that would have no ideology, really. Does child tax credit have an ideology? Does, does helping feed poor families poor children have an ideology or is it just good common sense as well as you know, you know something that ought to be done in order to sort of narrow the divisions that are that exist economically in this country and it's just it's depressing because it grows that cancer grows each and every day as you listen to various candidates and uh, you know listen to the ideology that they espouse that they that they uh, they want to create more divisions the governor of florida uh, state by states, uh, some states have passed already legislation that you can call uh, the police or someone that your neighbor went and had an abortion. You can be the witness. Uh, it's just, you know, it makes you wonder, you know, how much we take for granted what we have. Uh, and it's a scary thing, at least to me, to think that too many of us take too much for granted. We think it's always going to be great in this country. Well, it might not always be great. It's a great country, but uh, you know, defending it and preserving and protecting democracy is a full-time job. And a lot of people understandably are too busy, too worried about their own families and the family income to really uh, you know, take notice of it. I mean, listen, you know it as well as I do. I mean, you have one political party, a major political party in thrall to one guy, Donald Trump, one guy. And I would challenge anybody to go back and look at what he said since he lost the presidency. Since he lost the presidency, find me one thing he has said that would be meaningful to helping the 
the average American family. You won't find it. You'll find everything that he says and does is about one constituent himself. And that's where we are. He has enormous enormous power, enormous influence in that party. So as somebody who has studied the human condition, I understood the first time around Trump getting elected. Hillary was a bad candidate. And let's take a flyer. And he's an outsider. and All the stuff. And maybe he's just saying stuff to get elected. But after four years of seeing what we saw and the racism and the hate and the, 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 the spewing of, of, of bile, Almost one in two Americans, 40 some odd percent of Americans said, yeah, I'll take more of that. As somebody who's done 4,000 columns, as somebody who has just talked to, walked with great leaders and, and has spent his time talking to the everyman, just to explain that to me. And, and I ask this of every guest, and, and we all kind of come at it a different way. But just as somebody who has the perspective you have, just, I got it in 2016, explain it to me again. Yes, we say Biden won by 7 million votes, but a hundred million some odd people put their thumbs up to what they saw for those four years. So explain that to me on human terms. You can't, you can't. Human nature is endlessly fascinating. Uh, I'll tell you a story about, uh, you know, Donald Trump, the candidate, the joke as a candidate uh, toward the middle and end of 2015. There was a rainy, it wasn't a rainy, freezing rain, sleeting night in Manchester, New Hampshire about two days prior to the New Hampshire primary in 2016. And there was a Trump rally at the Verizon Center on uh, Elm Street, which is the main street in Manchester, New Hampshire. It tells you quite a bit about New Hampshire, the the main street, the biggest street in Manchester, New Hampshire, the biggest city in New Hampshire, is a dead end. (laughs) So (laughs) anyway... It's true. That's very funny. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the, and Trump was in Concord, New Hampshire, giving a speech prior to his appearance at this rally for him at the Verizon Center. So he was he was late in attending, and I was there. Uh, John Highland was with me actually, and uh, I never ever go to the press section. I don't. I've never done that. I walk around, find a seat, you know, no matter where it is, sit down and shoot the shit with people who are sitting around you. So we're walking around uh, in the Verizon Center, and prior to every Trump rally, they'd play music. And the music that they were playing was turned up, you know, the volume went to 10, they had the volume at 11. And the music collection was incredibly eclectic. It was really good, too. Uh, Rolling Stones, uh, Neil Diamond, uh, some Beethoven, uh, just, just a crazy mix of music, but all all the music, all the songs played were filled with energy and drive. And so finally he shows up and he strolls onto the stage with his wife. His wife was there and Melania stands on the stage, but he walks back and forth, waving and pointing to people and everything like that. And the first thing you noticed, or at least the first thing that I noticed that night uh, was there were a lot of what I call leaners. And when you go to rallies, uh, the, no matter who the candidate is, if you watch the crowd and you find several people, or certainly more than five or ten uh, people who like lean forward as if they want to touch the candidate or think they're going to hear better or get closer to the candidate, well, that whole whole thing, the, the whole Verizon Center, I think probably you know. 3,000 people in it, 4,000, maybe more. I don't know what the capacity was, but it was filled to capacity. They were all leaning. And I said to myself, hmm, <laughs> this is interesting. He wasn't a clown there. And then he began, and I had seen him before, but not like this. And the, to the point of the question you raised, which is virtually unanswerable, really, at this time, people liked his toughness and the toughness wasn't physical because we know he's not a tough guy. He's a coward. He's a bully, but the toughness of his language, because the toughness of his language, I think reminded them of the way they talk. And he had that down. He sounded like someone you'd bump into at the Exxon station when you're putting gas in your car, someone you knew sounded like someone who was familiar to you. And 
he talked about. And so I think people started thinking to themselves, this is the guy I want. I want to give the finger to so many people around me, to my boss, to the government, to the post office that doesn't deliver my mail on time, to the tax man who takes too much out of my check. He is me. And, you know, to people, to too many people. I feel badly for a lot of them because they are true believers and they think that he can make a difference in their lives. He can make a difference in their lives to the negative, but they don't get that yet. Maybe they never will. Yeah, I, I, I always broke it down to, and it was a simple authoritarian playbook, is that if somebody's unhappy, and I believe that 40 some odd percent of the people in this country are unhappy, if not more, and instead of blaming themselves, you say, it's not your fault, it's, it's the other's fault, it's the Mexican's fault, it's it's the media's fault, it's big corporations, it's just not your fault, you have a lot in life. That's a powerful message, and that trumps, no pun intended, everything else. And it's a message that resonates, and it's a message that is the, the fascist playbook. Uh, and it's frightening. So I want to ask you as a guy going back to your website that likes to see the good in people. One of the most troubling things that has happened in the coverage of Donald Trump is that too many people in the media not only imply, but basically state sometimes, either in print or you know, on TV shows, that these people who voted for Trump are bad people. They're not bad people. Some are. Some of them are some, bad some, people. Yeah, absolutely. But not all of them. And and I I I take a little point of difference with you on when you say that people are unhappy. I don't think it's so much as that they're unhappy, is that they're wondering what's happened to my country. And that's where, to your other point, and you write about this, that's where the concept of the outsider, which Trump dwells on, no matter what the language he uses, he dwells on the outsider. They're coming to take your job. They're coming from overseas to take your job. They're they're getting better treatment in terms of housing and pay than you are. They drive around in new cars. You don't. And it's sort of like the Tucker Carlson things. I was going to bring that up. It's not you. It's not you. It's them, the outsiders in our lives who have changed this country. You call someone on an 800 line because your refrigerator is broken, they don't speak English. You drive through a window to get a burger at Burger King or McDonald's, they don't speak English. They don't understand me. So it's not us, it's them, the outsiders. And they worry about their children in school. You know, are the kids getting a better edu- a better education because of everything's happened. No, they're not. I mean, you know, I got a bunch of Cambodian kids in my school with my kids, you know, and they're getting preferential treatment. And that's the danger, the all, the real, I think, the real threat to this country that Trump has succeeded in pulling off. I mean, getting so many people so aggravated, so angry, and so scared of their futures because of who? The outsiders. Yeah. No, I think that's the essence. And as we head to 2040, where whites will be a minority in this country. And it's what you, you know, yeah. look, our friend Nick, Kef- Nick uh, Compassori did an amazing job on that piece on Tucker Carlson, who's, who's got the megaphone, who just hits replacement theory. I mean, it was really a stunt. We all knew it, but just to kind of see the numbers and, and see just what he preaches every night. And the problem with so, so many people on our side of the media is they're not even listening to what's coming from the other side. It's just we're in this echo chamber. And then to just kind of just read through that and understand this guy who is by far the most successful anchor, and what he literally preaches every night is stunning. Have you ever met him? No, nor do I have a desire. He just seems like such a douchebag to me. I mean, he just seems like (laughs) one of the biggest schmucks of all time. He seems like a guy that had his lunch money taken when he was a kid and is pissed off. And Give me a take. Uh, Obviously, you have. What are your thoughts? Well, you know, and I say this intentionally, I used to know him. Uh, and I got to know him when he was at MSNBC and uh, for a couple of years. And uh, he was he was a funny guy. He had a, an ironic look at daily life, uh, but he wasn't anywhere near who he is today, which has always made me wonder who he really is. Uh, is this how much of this is an act? I mean, I don't know. 
but I, I, I used to share rides with him from the old MSNBC studio in Secaucus, New Jersey to LaGuardia on Thursday or Friday nights. He'd be going to LaGuardia to take a plane to Maine. Uh, I'd be going to LaGuardia to go to Boston, but you know, we'd shared, I shared the same car with him several times. Um, you know, and you come away with the thing, well, not a bad guy, you know, kind of different with the bow tie and everything like that, but not a bad guy. But now, you know, what Nick Confessori spent a year writing about, uh, which is of great value, incidentally, the Times pieces that you just referred to, and the, the nightly spectacle of who he attacks and what he says and how he does it. I mean, there is an element of raw genius there in what he does. And he knows he has to know exactly what he's doing. And back to what we were just talking about, it's the them and us. It's not you. It's them. I think there's it's a pretty problem. dangerous. It's interesting because people, I, I've known Trump for a lot of years, and people always ask me, you know, was he always this way? And, and I always say he was not a guy that you'd want to do business with or you'd want to be the foxer with, but you thought it was like this, almost this hapless lounge act that he was kind of in on the joke. And I think what happened to Trump and what happened to Tucker Carlson, it is performance-based that it, they get a reaction. From a crowd, yeah. Trump would say something like, you know, uh, whatever he would say, put, you know, lock her up. And then that feeds and that it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And that becomes who they are. The the reaction becomes their proaction, in effect. And it just it it feeds them so that um it's that it's that dynamic. And it's it's uh but he's a scary guy. He's just, uh, there's a guy on at 11 o'clock, if you watch Fox, that's even scarier that the way. I would just happen to watch a clip and he was like talking about, you know, Brian Stelter, you know, from CNN and calling him fat. We can't listen to this fat. Like, like what, what planet are we on? It's just, so I want to go back to your website, which says that you see the good in people. Give me, as we head into a period where potentially half this country abortion is legal, where we head into a point as we head to our next presidential election, where the, the real big story is what's happening in the state legislatures that, the very thing we feared would happen the last time around that just just only because of a few brave people and Brad Rasmus, Rappens, Burgers of the world didn't happen. It's set up to happen. That it is set up right now, right now for our elections to not be seen as credible anymore. So as we go against this backdrop, give me the optimistic view. Tell me why it's going to be okay. And maybe it's not because I, I just, and I'm an optimistic guy. But I am so worried. And, and the thing that scares me is this thing. I'm holding up my phone in that yeah. it is it, you can't put that genie back in the bottle. And we live in a world of bespoke media. So as we look at the overturn of Roe v. Wade, as we look at the Trump candidate Vance in Ohio winning, and yes, he only got 30 percent of the vote, but he still won by 10 percent, 10 percent. As we look at 70 percent of Republicans who think the election was false, as we look at 15 percent of those people that in the country that believe in the 15% of Republicans that believe in the QAnons, that basically it's a Jewish cabal of, of, of pedophiles running the Democratic Party. As we set that backdrop, tell me why I should feel optimistic. Give me, give me the hope, because you're the guy, you have the perspective. <laughs> and there are I, very few people I get to talk to that are older than me now. And I listen harder when I talk to people that are older than me. So give me the optimistic view. It's hard to, it's hard to get there. I, I I do admit that it's hard to get there. I mean, the things that you just mentioned, they're all real. Uh, and they're all right here, right now, not down the road. Um, but there's something about this country that has survived so much. I used to think up until about a year ago uh, that 1968, uh, what happened in 1968, that if we survived all of that, Two assassinations, Robert Kennedy, Martin Luther King, a horrendous war that seemed not to be able, we didn't seem to be able to end the country, all of it. Uh, I thought that was the worst that we'd ever been through, at least in my lifetime. And I no longer think that uh, because of several of the items that you just mentioned. But there's something restorative about the American spirit. Uh, it's almost like, you know, a great heavyweight fighter, you know, takes a couple in the jaw, drops down to one knee and goes to 
to a count of eight or nine, but gets up. And this country always seems to get up. That resilience, I mean, I might be a dreamer, but I still think it's there. Uh, the Supreme Court decision this week, I don't know what that's going to do. This country does so much good around the world that maybe we ought to focus on the good that the country, the government can do here. And the, the, the good that people every day perform each, each day in this country. It, it's all there. But again, it gets back to what we were talking about earlier, about a half an hour ago. I mean, the spirit of democracy, the spirit of America, we take it for granted. We take who we are for granted. We don't know our own history uh, as well as we should. I grew up in a great country. I grew up in a, in a country with the gifts were, in, were right there in abundance for you. If you were willing to work hard, the gifts are all right there. Are the gifts of democracy still there? I think they are, but I think they're harder to get to. They're harder to reach, and they're harder now to hold on to because of what's happened in our politics in Washington, D.C. Mike, I, I love your kind of analogy to a heavyweight fighter because that, that's where I see this country. I, 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 despite what's going on, I feel that transformational people show up, and I feel there will be candidates, and it could come from either side that will understand that, frankly, I think 70 or 80% of the country live in the same place. That we're, you know, when you sit down and talk to people, the one thing, one thing that kind of hit me, the story, I think I've told this on the air, that really moved me once. I had said something on the air and I was making a, a comparison to that, uh, a Nazi comparison to Trump and what, and a guy wrote me on my DM and was like, how dare you call me a Nazi, you know, fuck you, you piece of shit. You know, the, all the stuff that you get. And I saw that the guy was a veteran and I saw that he was a father and I wrote him and I said, I, I you know, the last thing I want to do is upset somebody like you. You're a great American. We probably have more in common than a part. What I really said was this, I explained it. And three texts later, we were calling each other brother, you know, guy from Alabama. And I think we're more alike than we are separate. And I think that my hope is that leaders emerge. Um, that somehow understand that and that somehow can tap into that. Because I do believe, yes, there's a fringe on both sides, but I do believe if you sit down and you have a beer with, with people, Heineken did an amazing campaign a few years ago. They would, they put two people in a room. All right. And they said to them, you guys have to work on a project together and build this bar together. And previously they had showed people, they interviewed both those people. And one person was said it was a transgender person, and the other person hated transgender people. And you know, what was it? All that then they worked together for an hour. They didn't know anything about each other. Then they played the tape for both the people. And then they said afterwards, you guys still want to have a beer together? And they're like, Yeah, we'd love to have a beer together. And it was like they had just got to know each other those people. And they weren't built in and they weren't knocked. And they did this with a lot of people from different parts of the polar perspective. And I believe that we do share a lot more than we, we are, we're different. And unfortunately, the business that we're in does not highlight that. So that's my hope. Mike, before we go, I just want to ask you one or two more questions. You've been very generous with your time. You are good friends with our president. We talk a lot about this on the air, about that there are a lot of things that he's done right. You can't argue with one move in Ukraine. Um, jobs have never been better. Yes, the stock market's bad now. We have inflation. Um, but he's done a lot of things right. And why is that not translating? Why are why are his numbers so low? Uh, because of something that happened to me yesterday. It was the day when everybody in our business, uh, and a lot of people who are not in our business, were walking around, walking into walls, talking about the supposed decision that was leaked to Politico on, uh, on Roe v. Wade. And while they were doing that, uh, I had come out of uh, where I was stunned at a couple of <laughs> the price rise, like within a week price hike in uh, meat. And from the grocery store, I went to the gas station, which was about two blocks from the grocery store. And I'm there putting the gas in my car, looking at the thing that was four eighty nine dollars a gallon. And a landscaping truck pulls in next to me. A couple of guys get out, they put the, the, uh, the pump in their thing, and, then, and they start swearing. And I'm thinking to myself, when election day comes, Who's, what are they going to be talking about? They're going to be talking about Roe v. Wade, or they're going to be talking about how much gas costs? Well, guess what? They're going to be talking about how much gas costs. The problem for the Democratic Party is they no longer, too many of them, no longer speak 
like Americans speak. I mean, if you're a Democrat running for office, uh, you should take a listen to the to the state senator from Michigan in her in her speech about ten days ago. Amazing. About about what? Yeah, they should McMorrow, Senator McMorrow. Take a look at it if you can find it online. YouTube, you can find that. But think about things like this. You want politicians, especially if you're a Democrat running for office, you got to point out the ignorance and the the hypocrisy of the Republican Party. This is a party that says, hey, don't tell me that I have to wear a mask. My decision not to wear a mask is a personal choice and leave the government out of it. So stay away from me. And now that same party is saying, but for women, you can have an abortion. You can't have, you basically can't have an OBGYN. You know, you can't take care of yourself. But the mask, that's a personal choice. Like abortion, like having a procedure is not. You get to point out the hypocrisy of these people in plain English sentences, which most Democrats don't know how to employ. But Mike, to your point, does that hypocrisy trump the 489 gas price? The end of the day, if you're sitting against the back, that's the sad part. That's the scary part. That's the scary part. No. Yeah. The two G's done. The two G's are going to dominate politics for the next four or five months, gas and groceries. All right, Mike. So before you go, the question, the premise of this whole podcast is that kind of everything is a brand, every person, every celebrity, every institution. We're, we're all brands. The Supreme Court's a brand. So what's the Mike Barnacle brand? <laughs> uh, a lucky guy. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. A, an ordinary guy who got lucky at a lot of different things in his life. <laughs> and I, mean, you- I mean, really lucky. Yeah, you know, I, I've had the privilege of getting uh, talk to my audience of getting to know Mike personally, and beyond being one of the brightest guys around, an amazing father, amazing husband, just one of the best got all around guys in the world. So, Mike, I I know I know I, time is precious, and I appreciate your time, my friend. Donnie, thank you very much. I appreciate you. All right, man. Enjoy your day. Say hi to the family. Okay. Hope you enjoyed our interview with Mike Barnacle and our Brands of the Week. And as always, remember to rate, review, and subscribe anywhere you get podcasts, whether it's Spotify, Apple, anyplace else. Please rate, review, and subscribe. You can watch our videos on YouTube. And please subscribe there and leave your comments there. We'd love to hear from you. Stay safe. Have a great week. We'll see you next week. Or you'll hear us next week. Or maybe you'll see us next week on our brand. Everybody, thanks for watching. If you like it, hit that subscribe button. And we love having you here watching On Brand and just don't miss any future episodes. So don't forget to hit that subscribe button. We'll see you next time.